Chapter Eighteen of Mary, a fiction by Mary Wollstonecraft. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Paul Gonzalez. Chapter Eighteen. The ladies heard that her servant was to be married that day, and that she was to sail in the vessel which she was then clearing out at the custom house. Henry heard, but did not make any remarks, and Mary called up all her fortitude to support her and enable her to hide from the females her internal struggles. She thus did not encounter Henry's glances when she found that he had been informed of her intention, and, trying to draw a veil over her wretched state of mind, she talked incessantly, she knew not what, flashes of it burst from her, and then she began to laugh, she could not stop herself. Henry smiled as one for Sally's, and looked at her with such benignity and compassion, that he recalled her scattered thoughts, and the ladies go in to dress for dinner. They were left alone, and remained silent a few moments. After a noisy conversation that appeared solemn, Henry began. You are going, Mary, and going by yourself. Your mind is not in a state to be left to its own operations. Yet I cannot dissuade you if I attempted to do it. I should all deserve the title I wish to merit. I only think of happiness. Could I obey the strongest impulse in my heart? I should accompany thee to England, that such a step might endanger your future peace. Mary, then, with all the frankness which marked her character, explained the situation to him and mentioned her fatal tie with such disgust that she trembled for her. I cannot see him. He is not the man formed for me to love. Her delicacy did not restrain her, for her dislike to her husband had taken root in her mind long before she knew Henry. She did not fix on Lisbon rather than France on purpose to avoid him. And if Anne had been in tolerable health, she would have flown with her to some remote corner to have escaped from him. I intend, said Henry, to follow you in the next packet. Or shall I hear of your health? Oh, let me hear of thine, replied Mary. I am well, very well, but thou art very ill. Thy health is in the most precarious state. She then mentioned her intention of going to Anne's relations. I am her representative. I have duty to fulfil for her. During my voyage, I have time enough for reflection, though I think I have already determined. Be not too hasty, my child, he interrupted Henry. Far be it from me to persuade thee to do violence to thy feelings, but consider that all thy future life may probably take its cooler from thy present mode of conduct. Our affections as well as our sentiments are fluctuating. We will not perhaps always either think or feel as you do at present. The object you now shun may appear in a different light. He paused. In advising thee in his style, I have only thy good heart to marry. She only answered to expostulate. My affections are involuntary, yet they can only be fixed by reflection. And when they are, they make quiet a part of my soul. When to riven in it, animates my actions and form my taste. Certain qualities are calculated to call forth my sympathies, and make me all I am capable of being. The governing affection gives its stamp to the rest, because I am capable of loving one. I have that kind of charity to all my fair creatures, which is not easily provoked. Milton has deserted, the earthly love is a scale by which to heavenly we may ascend. She went on with eagerness. My opinions in some subjects are not wavering. My pursuit through life has ever been the same. In solitude was my sentiments formed. They are indelible, and nothing can efface them but death. No, death itself can efface them. All my soul must be created for fresh, and not improved. Yet a little while I am parted from my aunt. I could not exist without the hope of seeing her again. I could not bear to think that time would wear away. I could not bear to think that time could wear away an affection that was founded in what is not liable to perish. You might as well attempt to persuade me that my soul is matter, and those feelings arose from certain modifications of it. The enthusiastic creature, whispered Henry, how you steal into my soul, she continued. The same turn of mind which leads me to adore the author of all perfection, which leads me to conclude that he only can fill my soul, forces me to admire the faint image, the shadows of his attributes here below and my imagination gives all the strokes to them. I knew I am in some degree under the influence of a delusion, but it is not this strong delusion proves that I myself am the subtler 
essence than the trodden clod of these flights of the imagination, point to futurity. I cannot banish them. Every cause in nature produces an effect, and I am an exception to the general rule. Have I desires implanted in me only to make me miserable? Will they never be gratified? Shall I never be happy? My feelings do not accord with the notion of the solitary happiness. In a state of bliss, it will be the society of beings who can love, without the alloy that earthly infirmities mixed with their best affections, that will constitute a great part of our happiness. With these notions, can I conform to the maxims of early wisdom? Can I listen to the cold dictates of early prudence and bid my tumultuous passion cease to vex me? Be still, find content in groveling pursuits, and the admiration of the misjudging crowd, when it is only one who wish to please, one who could be yours well to me. Argue not with me, I am bound by human ties, but in my spirit ever promise to love, or could I consider when forced to by myself, take a vow, that at the awful day of judgment I must give an account of. My conscience does not smite me, and that being who is greater than the internal monitor may approve of what the world condemns, sensible that him I live. Could I brave his presence, I hope in solitude to find peace. If I acted contrary to conviction, that the world might approve of my conduct, what could a world give to compensate for my own esteem? It is every hostile in arms against a feeling heart. Which is an honour await me, and the court moralists might desire me to sit down and enjoy them. I cannot conquer my feelings, until I do. What are these baubles to me? You may tell me a fall of fleeting good, an ignis fatus, but this chase, these struggles prepare me for eternity. When I no longer see for a glass darkly, I shall not reason about, but feel in what happiness consists. Henry had not attempted to interrupt her. He saw she was demeaned, and that of these sentiments were not the fusion of the moment, but well-digested ones. A high sense of honour, and respect for the source of all virtue and truth. He was startled, if not entirely convinced by her arguments. Indeed, her voice, her gestures were all persuasive. Someone now entered the room, who looked an answer to her long harangue. It was fortunate for him. Or he might have been led to say what in a cool moment he had it in to conceal. But it was necessary to reveal it. He wished not to influence her conduct, vain precautions she knew she was beloved, and could she forget that such a man loved her, or rest satisfied with any inferior gratification? When passion first enters the heart, it is only a return of affection that is sought after, in every other remembrance and wish is blotted out. End of chapter 18